May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. This morning's Torah portion is Parshat Vayishlach. Vayishlach means, and he sent. <clears throat> now, how many of you, all right, I'm not going to ask that because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, if you did the reading from this, you know, for this week, uh, from Genesis uh, chapter uh, 32 in verse 4, uh, you will see that that verse begins, and he commanded. So where then is, and he sent? Well, you have to go back a verse to verse 3. Why is that? Well, remember that the uh, the addition of the chapters and the verses was a much later addition. And what you'll find, and this is what I, I was saying to, to Dan, uh, because the, initially the overhead only, you know, started with, and he commanded, is because sometimes, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen, the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible don't match. They don't match. This is one of those cases. Verse 4 in the Christian Bible is actually verse 5 in the Hebrew Bible. Which means verse 4 in the Hebrew Bible is verse 3 in the Christian Bible. If you look at that particular verse, it begins, And Jacob sent messengers to Esau. That's where the name of this portion comes from. Vayishlach. And he sent. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. That is why this portion is called Vayishlach. Now, in the story, Jacob is about to confront his greatest fear. When last we left our hero, he, when he left his house, okay, his brother and he were not really on good terms. So at the beginning of this portion, he sends messengers to Esau. This is like, um, you know, like when we find, when we're, when we're kids and we want something from our parents. Dad, Mom, you're the best parents ever. I mean, ever. There's never been parents as good as you ever in the history of the entire world. And I love you so much. All right, what do you want? Yeah. And so, so Jacob is, is sending uh, these messengers out to let Esau know that he's coming in the hopes that it would put Esau in a mood to receive him well. Well... The messengers go, they come back. Not only did they say, yeah, we told him, but they said, oh, by the way, he's on his way to meet you. And oh, he's not alone. And for the record, he's got 400 people with him. But that's okay. And so he spends the night there after praying. He prays, spends the night. In the morning... Jacob thinks to himself, well, what if the messengers weren't enough? What if he's coming with 400 people to kill me and not to give me a big old hug? Maybe, I know, gifts, presents work. I'll send him gifts. So he sends him something. He sends him goats. Yay, goats. But not just one goat, and not just two goats. Jacob sends his brother 200 goats. That's a lot of goats. I know I wouldn't have room for them in my living room. But it's not just 200 goats. It's 200 female goats with a whole bunch of male goats. And then it's, it's, a, it's goats, and it's sheep, and camels. Oh, my. All of this representing the proverbial apple on the teacher's desk. You know, hey, look, you know, maybe if I shine that sucker up, you know, she won't 
she won't recognize that perhaps my homework is not on her desk when it's supposed to be. So he's hoping to butter up Esau uh, before, uh, before they get together, and so he sends these gifts. Now that night, what he does is, he's like, okay, maybe the gifts aren't even going to work. If I have any hope of saving my family, here's what I need to do. I need to split them in half. I need to send one half way over here and the other half way over here so that if Esau has any ill intent and he goes after this half of the family, then this half of the family will, will be able to get away and my, my family will live. If, on the other hand, he sees and goes after this side of the family, this side of the family will go and escape and live, and therefore my family will endure. So that's what he does. He splits them up. He sends half of them that way, half of them that way, until he finds himself alone. Alone. Now, we could spend probably two or three weeks looking at this next bit of, bit of scripture. Because he doesn't, he, he's not really alone. He thinks he's alone. The scripture says he's alone and then all of a sudden there's a guy with him. If you've ever said to somebody, leave me alone, you have to understand the alone that Jacob was in, in that he wasn't really alone. You could say to somebody, leave me alone, and they could leave. But as a believer, you're never alone because God is always with you. And that's what happened that night. In this place of aloneness, he realizes that he isn't really alone. And in the end, he's a changed man for it. Now, he doesn't really have time to process this, though, because he wrestles with the, with the, the Lord until morning, finishes that whole scene, then he looks up and there's Esau coming. He's got no time to process any of what happened. Looks up, here comes Esau. And you can almost feel the tension in this moment. It's been more than two decades since the last time he saw his brother. And they were not on good terms at that time, remember. Okay? But time has healed those wounds of the past. And when we see the brothers reuniting, it's with joy. Esau runs to meet his brother. This is the guy who wanted to kill him. Now he's running and he hugs him and there's crying. And this is a joyous reunion. And after they make up, the families part ways again. It was sweet though. They were able to reconnect and know afterwards that they were a family and nothing was coming between them. Of course, we know that it doesn't stay that way, but Jacob settles then in Shechem, where the incident with Dinah takes place, and as a result, Jacob and his family have to leave the area and go back to Bethel. There, God reiterates the promise that he made uh, to Abraham and Isaac to Jacob. Then he travels on, and they're traveling on. They're heading towards Bethlehem, Bethlehem. And uh, on the way between, uh, well, today they call it Bethel, but it's Bethel. You know, on the way from Bethel to Bethlehem, uh, Rachel gives birth. Rachel gives birth. She dies in the process and is buried there between Bethel and Bethlehem. Uh, and that's where this portion sort of leaves Jacob and his family, except for one last thing. Um, this portion, we also read about the, the death of Isaac. Now, we don't really read a lot about Isaac in the scriptures, uh, apart from when he was a little kid, uh, and then when, he's, uh, when, he sends, um, when he sends for uh, sends Jacob away for, uh, for to find a wife. Um, there's also very little mention of his death. Um, however, what we do know, and I think the important thing, is that we see Jacob and Esau together together to bury their father. It's the same story as with Ishmael and Isaac when they were burying Abraham. 
We thought they had been estranged forever, never, never to see each other again. And now all of a sudden, at the death of their father, they come together. There was something that was very unifying in that. And, um, and in the same way that they did before, the brothers get together again for their father's funeral. Then in this portion, we read about the descendants of Esau. This is what connects, by the way, the Torah and the Haftarah portion. The Haftarah portion was designed to bring back to mind the portion from the Torah that at the time of the captivity, the Jewish people were not allowed to read. They were forbidden from reading the Torah. However, they weren't forbidden from reading the prophets. 